Welcome to the Novelty Podcast. My <laughs> name is Alexandra. And my name is Emily. And I like to say I read from the perspective of a what the writer owes the reader. And I like to read from the perspective of <laughs> what the reader owes the book. And tell me a little bit about the tea we're drinking about today. today drinking about? No, we're just drinking it. We're just drinking it, but that's fine. That's yeah. enough. <laughs> we're drinking uh, ruby chai today, mm -hmm. which to me tastes very much like a rose petal chai, which is like beautiful. Yeah, we have this lovely loose leaf tea today. It's very fancy. We're very fancy. We pulled out the teapot and everything. That's right. So it's October. It's our October episode. We're going spooky season here. Going all the way. We're going with actually the first spooky season book, shall we say? Yeah. What are we talking about? We're talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Absolutely. A book which we do not agree about. <laughs> that is true. I mean, you know, we often have a lot of overlapping opinions. We don't always agree 100% on everything that we read, but this one is one that we disagree on yes. quite a bit. And I feel like at the heart of our disagreement is our two different approaches that we kind of yes. have identified. I think that that's very true. Like, I am looking at this book from the perspective of a writer. You are looking at this book from the perspective of somebody who analyzes what she's reading, and in consequence, yeah. we have different feelings. Yes. <laughs> and you're, I think you're also looking at it as like as a writer looking at Mary Shelley too. Absolutely, because I feel like the world has merged mm -hmm. Mary Shelley with her work, and so yeah. like for me at least, I can't really see the two as separate. Yeah. Um, whether that's fair or not, like that is the world in which we live. Yeah. So when I first started reading this book, the reason I read it was mm -hmm that I think it was in 2021, like Mary Shelley was kind of having a moment on the mm -hmm. internet. There was a biopic that came out about her. There was a children's book that came out about her. Um, the like internet was all about like how, you know, she invented science fiction horror in essence, which can I just start by saying that's great. Mm -hmm. like, that's really cool that we yeah. know that she basically invented this. Mm -hmm. And like, as a area in which we live where like women are not often acknowledged for their you know, contributions mm -hmm. to culture, like, it's really cool that we can point to this and be like, hey, like, a woman actually invented this form of writing. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And it's a really significant work on its own two legs in the sort of canon of English literature as we look true. at it. Yeah. So we can, we can definitely say those things as truth. But I also noticed, like, on the internet that she is held up very much as a feminine icon, which, okay. But often the reason that she's held up that way is because she was very promiscuous for her time era. One might say for any time era. <laughs> <laughs> and it's treated as if she behaved that way because mm -hmm. she was purposefully like flying in the face of her culture and saying, no, I won't be like mm -hmm. confined to your, you know, typical standards of behavior. living. Exactly. Yeah. But if you really like get into like the way that she like lived her life, Often, like, she felt like she had the right to behave in certain mm -hmm. ways, but if other women did, she would be like, oh, no, like, that's that hurts my feelings. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, she was very exclusive. It was not about changing things for women. It mm -hmm. was basically like, I feel like I should be allowed to behave like this regardless of who it hurts. Right. But you can't hurt me. Like, you right. can't do anything to hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, when people are like, oh, yeah, the fact that, you know, she had sex on her mother's grave with her husband, you know, yeah. who wasn't her husband at the time and was married to someone else. Isn't that cool? I'm like, is it? Because yeah. his wife went and killed herself because of that happened. Yeah. And then when her husband did the same thing to her, she was like, well, how dare? Yeah. Like, how dare he treat me like this, even though I treated his wife like this? Right. You know, it's like, I feel like this is a very frustrating thing in feminism is like, the feminism gold star mm -hmm. is not given out for accomplishment. It's given out for bad behavior. Mm. And it's pretended like bad behavior is in actuality like women right. women going against the yeah. flow. Yeah. When if you really look at it, like oftentimes when, it's just bad behavior. Yeah. When someone's selfishness gets recast as sort of like political work that's those aren't necessarily the same thing now it may be appropriate for a person to assert their rights as an individual to do things that are for their own benefit and for within their own rights and that sort of thing but it also and you know we have you kind of reference this it's like feminism feminism for me but not for thee and it ultimately yeah. when we talk about feminism what we want to do is like have the whole community of women be lifted up as a result right and i feel like we can acknowledge people, who, women who had accomplishments, 
but still live within the confines of societal frames. You know, like mm -hmm. there are a lot of women who stand out in writing. Like mm -hmm. writing is an area and like women excel. Mm -hmm. um, like best-selling novelist of human history is female. Mm -hmm. All of the best-selling novelists of the golden age of mystery are female. Mm -hmm. Like these are big things, but I feel like we don't know those facts because those women also lived like ordinary lives where they weren't destructive to anyone <laughs> or anything else, you know? Yeah. And so we don't, give them the same credit mm -hmm. as a 16 year old who sleeps around, yeah. you know, and that is a really frustrating aspect of how we frame feminism to me. Mm -hmm. I get, get riled up. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you're, you're very well merited in that position. Yeah. It's just like for all of the people who, and it wasn't her mother, a, a famous person her in mother, the first wave feminism. Yeah. Writer? Her mother was actually a feminist writer. I don't, haven't looked into a lot of her work, but her mother actually was a writer on the concept of feminism. Right. And I think a lot of people gra graft that on to Mary Shelley, mm -hmm. who I don't believe, like, was a writer. But mm -hmm. I don't think she actually, like, specifically wrote on the topics of feminism in the way that her mother did. Right, exactly. Okay, so her mother is Mary Wollstonecraft, who was one of the major contributors to the um, vindication of the rights of women if I'm not mistaken, which is just a really groundbreaking and iconic essay in the fight for women's rights. And, you know, one can say Mary Shelley, in her own way, had feminist tendencies and that she did not allow society to say, like, oh, women don't write. Because, like, let's, let's be very clear. Like, in the 1940s, there were pastors mm -hmm. in pulpits declaring to their congregations that women should not be writers. Yeah. So we're talking about someone you know, way, way back writing, just writing because she wanted to write. Right. And I think that is important to acknowledge, but I don't think that that alone mm -hmm. makes you a feminine, feminist icon. Yeah. Because like a lot of women have done that mm -hmm. and achieved great things. Mm -hmm. And like where we settle the word icon on, I feel like is honestly kind of degrading a lot of mm -hmm. times because we tie that into a woman's sexuality. Mm -hmm. And if she doesn't have the sexuality that seems cool or hip or, mm -hmm. you know, on topic, then like, oh, like her feminine status is like lower to bit. Yeah. You know, oh, you were in like a 30 year marriage and had children in addition to all the other stuff you did. Well, you're not as cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. These are my feelings. <laughs> Go, go, Emily, go. <laughs> so how do you see some of those attitudes reflected in the work of Frankenstein? Well, Frankenstein itself, I find kind of frustrating. I guess the, in terms of like viewpoints that I really get frustrated with, because obviously like we're not supposed to look at Dr. Frankenstein and be like, what a great guy. What a great guy. <laughs> You're supposed to walk away from it, you know, feeling the horror of what he created, Yeah. you know, and being like, wow, you really fudged that up. Human beings shouldn't play God. <laughs> exactly. On a very basic level, that's the lesson of the, of the book. Yeah. But I get frustrated with like other characters in the book where I don't feel like it's as clearly laid out that this is not okay. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it almost feels like we're sainting this. So mm -hmm. like for me specifically, like the character that frustrates me the most is um, Frankenstein's mother, mm -hmm. who is treated like a saint throughout mm -hmm. the book. She's awful. <laughs> <laughs> She's very entitled. She's very upset that she didn't get a daughter. She feels entitled to a daughter. So she takes someone else's daughter because she feels mm -hmm. like she's entitled to like save a child. Mm -hmm. You know, she specifically saves the child that she saves because this child is blonde. And <laughs> Isn't it like her, her like niece or something? It's like her sister's child or something? No, I think she's like traveling through Italy oh. and she finds this like impoverished family and they have this Oh, blonde so it's kid. just like, it, oh, okay. So it's like, this is your cousin, Dr. Frankenstein, but it's like cousin yeah, in quotation okay, marks. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. But she's like, like literally the line is something like, dark skinned children are suited for poverty, but this mm -hmm. child is fair, so we should raise her up. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, no. okay. <laughs> and like, I know people would say like, you know, oh, it was of its time. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that big of a deal. I've had people say that basically to me in the 21st century. So right. for me, I feel when I like see it, like these are like, this is a fundamental text that a lot of people read and a lot of people take in. Mm -hmm. And I'm still seeing these ideas expressed almost directly yeah. in the same way to me. Like, I feel like there's dangers in yeah. like just being like, oh, well, like we can just like, ign we can, we can we ignore can, that. Yeah, let that go. Well, and I do wonder too, and you know, I don't know Mary Shelley's intent in this, and this kind of goes back to our like fundamental difference in reading is like, 
are we seeing two characters in the mother and also in Dr. Frankenstein himself of people who feel like they can form the world to their own conventions. And so it's like, oh, I, God didn't give me a daughter, so I'm going to go ahead and get my own. And like Dr. Frankenstein sort of saying, oh, I have this, like this hubris that of course is a huge theme. I'm going to go out and form man in my own image. I feel like possibly, but the difference is like Frankenstein creates a monster, yeah. right? The mother raises the daughter that she's, you know, mm -hmm. just takes. And she basically raises perfection. Right. Like this girl is treated as like she's perfection. And she kind of just true. exists to be like the perfect woman who eventually gets like murdered. Yeah. Uh, you know, so like. And, yeah. And is supposed to be the perfect spouse for Dr. Exactly. Person. Exactly. Yeah. So like there's nothing negative that comes from the behavior, mm -hmm. you know, of the mother figure. Um, and like, again, I don't like the way that she interacts with this daughter figure because mm -hmm. it's like. Basically, there's like an expectation of like, oh, we saved you from poverty. Therefore, everything that we want from you, you'll give to us. And the daughter's like, okay. Yeah. Like lack down of agency. Yeah. To down to like, you don't really get the sense that she like, wants to marry. Or exactly. even that Dr. Frankenstein wants to marry her. It's, it's they, just, they like keep delaying there. Yeah. It know, just gets engagement. very much treated like, like, oh, mom wants this. So this is yeah. what we're going to do. And I don't think that's ever reconciled. Like, mm -hmm. Do either of you want this? Like, mm -hmm. I don't get this impression, but it's still treated as like mom created mm -hmm. this like perfect girl. Yeah. So I don't, if that's the intent that yeah. like mom is also being portrayed as someone who kind of meddles with the way yeah. things are supposed to be, I don't feel like it's as clear yeah. in, in the, the way text. that it is that for Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. Who, yeah, who, yeah, Dr. Frankenstein, you don't miss it. Yeah. You know, like he's like, no, no, <laughs> things went awry. <laughs> yeah. Very <laughs> early on. <laughs> <laughs> mistakes were made yeah exactly you're all sitting there like sir yeah sir and there's like <laughs> heavy foreshadowing like oh ethics of science should we be doing this should we be playing god well and then i do want to bring up another little like twisty turny and I get, this is like i don't know this could be me reaching <laughs> Reach just, for us. Oh, this could you know there's like that meme that periodically circles on the internet of like, oh, the curtains were just blue. Like, it doesn't mean that the character was sad. <laughs> this might fit into that. <laughs> so go but, for it. But we're going to roll with it. Um, so in the myth of Prometheus, which it, if you guys listeners don't know, like the title for Frankenstein is um, Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus. Right. And so she's very explicitly referring to that Greek myth, which Again, if you don't know, that's the myth where Prometheus goes up to the heavenly realms and gets fire and brings it back for humanity. And then he gets punished by the great gods because he had too much hubris. It was a technology that wasn't intended for men to be able to have it. His punishment is Pandora. So the gods give him Pandora. He doesn't want to marry her. His brother wants to marry her, which mm -hmm. I think we see that parallel in his friend who seems like he's more interested in Elizabeth. I think that's her name. It's been a while since we both read this. Yeah, we, like, yeah. we did research. <laughs> we weren't going to force her to read it again. I'm not, I'm not doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, Elizabeth Lavenza, um, where he's trying to do this parallel where she's occupying the role of Pandora, who ultimately becomes like another punishment upon the human race, because of course she opens Pandora's box and she lets all the evils out, right? And there is an inversion on that, which you might say is feminist, because if you read the Greek myth, it's like, man, women, a curse upon the earth, you know? <laughs> and in fact, one of the... Um, one of the translations that I had read was like, she, her spirit was filled with bitchy whorishness or something like that. And you're like, geez, bro. Is that like how the Greeks wrote it? Or is that like a little bit of an exaggeration? But anyway, <laughs> and she was filled with a bitter spirit of whorishness. And you're just like, as she went to open the box and revealed all the evil, you know, and you're just, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and so, you know, in the in the context of of the myth, she's a curse upon humanity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a curse upon the the human race that before it didn't have you know women in this like cosmology, right? And so, is the it, are we getting enough feminism by inverting it? Because it's really Doctor Frankenstein who unleashes this horror upon the planet, right. and yeah. then he's like having to like chase it down in life. So I don't know. I don't know if it's intended by Mary Shelley to like set up these char characters in these parallels to the Prometheus myth. I don't know if it's a reach. Um, and if she's trying to flip the responsibility of like, who is really unleashing the evil upon this planet. Maybe. I just feel like she's extremely obvious and like, mm -hmm. tell it like it is mm -hmm. about like all of Frankenstein's issues. Yeah. 
And so when she's like potentially being obscure about other things, I'm like, I don't know if like I fully connect with that because yeah. I'm like, well, she like beats you over the head with it everywhere else in the novel. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, but your perspective, you have yeah. a lot about like the actual novel itself, yes. which I have some things about the writing, but let's start with like well, the I, novel itself. No, I think we should start with the writing because I do want to say like, I, my, we talked about Dracula previously and like these early entrants into uh, have we talked about Dracula on the podcast? I feel we like have an entire vampire. Oh, yeah. Which, That's right. by the way, if you're in spooky season right now, we have an entire vampire episode. <laughs> right. These early entrants into the horror genre, they really don't accomplish what we expect from the genre as right. modern readers today. Um, so we talked about, you know, Dracula. For me, it comes off as humorous rather than actually scary. It's a more fun novel. It is a lot of fun. And then Frankenstein, it's obviously... You know, it has intent behind it. It has a message that she is trying very hard, hard to, to um, express through the novel. I wouldn't necessarily say that Dracula has some sort of, like, deeper meaning that we're trying to explore here compared to, like, Franken Frankenstein. Like, she is yeah, explicitly, yeah, yeah, has a again, message. Again, she, she beats, beats you. you with that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, like, the style is definitely of its time. Yeah. Verbose, long-winded, big words. Sentences the size of paragraphs. So if that's not what you're into, then skip this one a skip. It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to read it. Yeah, I feel like if we're talking about like the construction of a good novel, because there obviously a lot of novels throughout history have a point, have a meaning, have mm -hmm. a philosophy behind them. Mm -hmm. Like that, and a lot of times that's why writers write because they're mm -hmm. trying to express mm -hmm. something that they deeply believe in. But a lot of times this novel, I feel like, veers into, like, my number one <laughs> issue with books, which is... Which we talked about in our first episode. First episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which my point is, like, if you want to write a novel, it has to function as a novel first. Mm -hmm. If you want to write an essay, write an essay. Yeah. And sometimes this book veers into, like, speech territory where, mm -hmm. like, the characters are just, you know, expounding upon their feelings and their ideals to the point where I'm just, like... I need you to shut up now and do something. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, specifically from the perspective of this is a horror book, um, part of horror and building horror is often brevity. Mm -hmm. And so when you draw something out, to me, you completely lose the actual horror mm -hmm. of it. The horror concept behind this book is just like, yeah. like, it's quite literal. Yeah. It's not necessarily in the atmosphere or mm -hmm. in the building or the writing. It's like literal. There is a monster built right. out of dead people parts. Right. And then it's also like the horror of being a human. It, because, of course, it's like it's actually about like who's the real monster? Like, is it Dr. <laughs> Frankenstein or is it the creature? And it's like, no, like it, the horror is like reconciling the evil that lives within it, within your heart and like your own pet, you know, like that. But that's also a very philosophical point. Like yeah. the novel is more so philosophizing about evil and horror than it is trying to give you the experience of horror. Right. Yeah. There were a number of occasions where I'm like, if we just stopped mm -hmm. right here. We would be building some atmosphere. Yeah. But you went another mile past that. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, to me, it was constantly stealing from itself mm -hmm. and undermining itself, you mm -hmm. know? Because you can express mm -hmm. really profound philosophical things without using, like, a million mm -hmm. words, mm -hmm. you know? And I know that's not the style of that time. And so mm -hmm. but part of it is just, like, kind of frustrating for me because you can just see, like, like we, we, were, we were there. I think mm -hmm. it was, like, the last... The last scene where they're in the Arctic and the monster shows up and I was just like, I need you not to talk anymore. Just <laughs> stop talking now. <laughs> the amount of talking that the yeah. monster does. <laughs> yeah. I think that one of the interesting things for me about the structure of the novel is that it does seem to be like quite a bit of a patchwork because we do have like these multiple point of view narratives. narratives. We start off with I think his name is Walton, the guy on the ship in the North Pole. And right. then it's like, then we get Dr. Frankenstein's narrative as he's telling Walton, like, his woes of life. And you're like, you can just shut it because I have no sympathy for you. Um, he but feels I, very sorry for himself. He does. <laughs> and, and then you also have, like, the interim passage with, like, the monster from his perspective. Right. Which was my favorite part of the story. 
not your favorite because <laughs> he talked too much. But I did enjoy that period where he is trying to understand who he is, move out into the world. He has that whole, especially the sequence where he's in the woods and he's observing this family from the outside. It's almost like this anthropological study where he's trying to figure out what does it mean to be a human being? Can I be a member of a community? And the you know, old gentleman who lives there is blind. So he has this hope of like, maybe I'll be accepted if he doesn't see it, like yeah, how yeah, horrific yeah. I look. Yeah. Because we have this whole like appearances versus reality where Dr. Frankenstein is accepted because he looks, he has this noble mean yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like, people are always like, oh, what a noble looking gentleman. <laughs> you know, and just assume that he's a good guy. And so I really did enjoy that that passage of that exploration of the inner world of, of, the, of, the, of the creature. Yeah. Um, and... You know, for a book that is as wordy as it is, it feels longer than that because it's not that long of a book, you know? It does feel very long. This was, okay, <laughs> I have to say, so you have heavily influenced me yeah. in terms of like not finishing books. This Good was job. from my era of like, I had to finish everything yeah. I read. So if you hadn't hit me with that yet, <laughs> that revelation that I didn't have to finish books, I probably yeah. would not have finished this. this. This is a book that I wouldn't even give to most people to start. <laughs> Unless you're like, boy, do I love reading very verbose, like Victorian stuff for some god awful reason, which I do. Like, I remember reading this and being like, what a page turner. <laughs> Oh boy, I read it in like three days. So I was like, this is fab. <laughs> I mean, while I'm like crawling to the finish line, like when this is going to be over, when are they going to stop having speeches? Like stop. Do you just need to stop? Because <laughs> the speeches are really essays of their perspective for like, you know, 40 pages straight. And you're like, okay, <laughs> I got your perspective. Um, but I, I enjoy it, or, or at least it doesn't hinder my enjoyment to the extent that I, I, I just think for, it's just, especially if you're like, I'm going in for horror and, <laughs> and spooks and surprises. And then it's like, how about some loosely string together essays on the nature of humanity? Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> then it's like, no, that's not going to satisfy. I'm going to derail you for a moment and ask sure. a question. If someone is like, okay, I want to, I want to read Frankenstein. I want to uh -huh. be you know, read, have read that classic. Yeah. When they go into it, like what attitude do you feel like they should go into it with? What they should be looking for? Which they should be focusing on? Well, because it's not the horror. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. For me, it is the puzzle of how this novel plays with the cosmology of the world and also how it interplays both with Christian myth or Christian, you know, uh, cosmology and and Greek myth and it, I, if I could do it I would have maybe I'll put up weird diagrams because we're <laughs> going to go into it in a little bit of like how I think these like meanings sort of layer and interplay with each other so if you enjoy decoding puzzles which is my favorite hobby <laughs> that's all I want to do all day long is play with ciphers and codes and puzzles and this is why I like literary analysis is I like putting all of the pieces together and being like that's Dr. Frankenstein his mother is Zeus she's Pandora let's line them dicky 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 you know and like how does that elucidate the meaning of of the work that's where it becomes a fun intellectual game but as an entertaining piece of literature I don't think that most people are going to get a huge entertainment value out of it right it would need you would need to go to it from a completely different perspective yeah which, which is the puzzle, the puzzle pieces. So let's go into some of that perspective that you have when you go into this book. Yeah, so, and, and I do think, gosh, it's just so gosh darn interesting. So obviously we've talked a little bit about the Promethe Prometheus myth. We have the explicit, you know, references to it. Um, and with the Greeks, as always, you have the overweening pride, you have the hubris um, that has to be, you know, the, the fatal flaw of right. Prometheus and therefore of Dr. Frankenstein. This is, I think, totally a legitimate interpretation of the book and like quite at face value. So that's the connection with Prometheus. Um, and then I already mentioned it, but we do have this theme of appearance versus reality, judging people by their external looks. That's pretty, you know, obvious in its in its right. The character themes. being, you know, the character that he meets being yeah. blind, and you know, like mm -hmm. this is the only person he's able to interact with. Like we're right. we're talking about like he, our ability to judge solely on visuals. On looks, which, like, frankly, is something I still struggle with to oh, this yeah. day. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's part of human nature, I yeah. feel like. Yeah. And then I also, I really love, and I've talked about this, like, on my channel before, when a 
a book uses its structure to reinforce its point. And I feel like the structure of the novel is a kind of Frankenstein together, if you will. Oh, like it's that. like that patchwork kind of thing where you get these all of these different stories and perspectives. And it's not even that like smooth of a book, to be honest. And I feel like yeah. the structure represents that sort of like that piecing together yeah. into a whole. Now, we also have, in addition to this Prometheus, the interplay with, with Christianity. So... And I think it asks this question, you know, what if God was appalled by Adam? Mm, interesting. And one of my favorite, like, short stories that I think is really, really great that I think people should read is a short story called uh, Rappuccini's Daughter. It's by um, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. So this is, like, much later. And perhaps he's influenced by this. But it's a concept that has stuck in my head ever since I read that story, which is... Um, I kind of don't want to give it away because I feel like the reveal is so good when you read the story. But anyway, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne is really interested in the lurid intermixture. It's a phrase that comes up in The Scarlet Letter and in the short story and in a lot of other places in his, in his works. This intermixture in human nature that we have both good and evil kind of intermixed together. And in the plot of uh, Rappuccini's daughter, you have a young man who falls in love with Rappuccini's daughter and they have a beautiful garden in the backyard, but they have this reputation of like cultivating all of these venomous plants, these plants mm. that are like horribly toxic. And because Dr. Rappuccini has raised his daughter in this context, she's able to freely move among the flowers and she becomes the, you know, basically the gardener. She tends to all of these flowers and, and there are these unique blooms and it's all, you know, beautifully described and everything in that Hawthorne way. And uh, the young man rents the house next to it. So he sees the garden and he falls in love with the young girl. But he can't go into the garden because it's full of all of these toxic, right. noxious fumes. But over time, he gets acclimated to it. And the, the climax of the novel is like, are they going to get together? Is he going to be able to kiss this beautiful young girl who literally has this like toxicity on her breath? And there's a... Uh, an evil character who's trying to keep them apart. And the the father figure is like delighted for them to fall in love. And he's like, it's at the moment they're going to get together. And then the evil character, you know, gets in the way and they can't get together. And it's this exploration of this idea of what if holiness is actually toxic for you to be in the very presence of God? Hmm. Interesting. And it's this like reverse Adam and Eve story. Can we bring sinful man into contact with divine, you know, and she's like this pure Eve, if you will, untouched mm -hmm. by the sin nature. And like, can God bring us and reconcile us back together? And I think this book kind of operates in a similar way where it's like, what if God, instead of when Frankenstein makes man in his own image, if you will, so he's, you know, adopting the role of Elohim God in this role, like creator God. And like, he creates this, this creature as God did with humanity that is like, we're neither angelic beings, nor are we base animals. Right. And how do we understand our place in the world? And that's the struggle of the creature as well. He's been birthed into this world, and then he's rejected by God the Father, if you will, sent mm. out of the garden. And how does he find his place in this world where he doesn't really belong? And he even longs for, as Adam does, a partner. And Adam goes through, you know, he names all the animals, and they come by two by two, and then he goes, but there's no helpmate for me. Mm -hmm. and, he, and so we see that Franken, or the creature also asks Dr. Frankenstein, okay, I've gone out into the world, and I found that there's no place for me in it please make a companion for me so that I can have a place in this world right and so I think that like if we layer now this cosmology of Prometheus with this Christian cosmology where we see Dr. Frankenstein occupying the role of Prometheus and occupying the role of Elohim God creator God um, and we parallelize those to each other then we also have like the like uh, pantheon of Greek gods then above that and then we have this development of uh, the Eve character would be, you know, the other creature that Dr. Frankenstein almost makes from. And then we also have, as I referenced before, we have this question of Elizabeth as occupying this role of Pandora. And so how do those narratives kind of layer on top yeah, of each other and talk to each other? And I think that's really the fun part of approaching a book like this. That's just so open to symbolic interpretation. Right. So readers, this is how you read this book. Yeah. Writers. Do not write like this. Because <laughs> you could still write a book that's full of symbolism, but right. that is fun to read. Exactly. So it's like she knocked it out of the part in one category, yeah, right. but not really in the other. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I have not read a lot for 
from this time era. I'm assuming she's not, while, well, like, the, like, genre itself is new, like, mm-hmm. her style of writing isn't particularly no, divergent. I think, no, I think she very much is, in terms of, like, the sentence structure and the vocabulary and also the attempts to make these highly symbolic stories, there are a lot of writers who are doing this in this time era um, and, and even earlier. But particularly the Victorians, they're very interested and perhaps less so with Greek mythology, that wasn't necessarily their jam, but definitely interested in writing these sort of like Christian allegories or stories that dealt with Christian themes and are kind of drawing out these these parallels and right. theolo- theological points, if you will. Um, and then I think one other theme that like does come up is obviously we have this sense of like Dr. Frankenstein is usurping authority that he ought not have to generate right. life in this way. And it's on the one hand, we can see him as usurping authority from, you know, Elohim creator God, if we're looking at the Christian cosmology. But when we flip it over to the other side and we take a look at the Pandora Prometheus myth in that way, it's like, are you usurping the authority of motherhood? Right. This generation of wealth that the, the ability to kind of like make a child, if you will. And, um, I think that theme of like motherhood versus fatherhood is less strong in this universe, but I think it's worth asking because I think that does tie into then this feminist question of like saying like, no, like men are reaching, overreaching their authority into areas where it doesn't belong, whether it's motherhood specifically or not. It's definitely an overreach. Do you think that ties into the mother character and Frankenstein being kind of like a saintly character and like a lot of what she does creates good. Um, I hesitate to say it because she is such an unpleasant character to be around. So it's like hard to interpret her in that light, especially as a modern reader. I don't know if that's how the book was intended to, to show her, but you know, if we contrast her with Dr. Frankenstein, she's taking a natural. So like, let's just adopt the Victorian mindset, which means that we're heck a racist right now, right? (laughs) And that we also have this sort of like Christian good works. Right. So then in that context, you know, she's going to Europe. Ew. I mean, Italy. Italy. Oh my. (laughs) Those are the gross Europeans. So like, (laughs) you have to remember, this is me being sarcastic, by the way. Italy, you're lovely people. It's not about you, Italy. It's about them. Okay. (laughs) I'm just embodying that mindset of the time. Um, And she's like saving this you know, angelic looking blonde child, right? Where as Italians are often dog haired. Yeah. yeah. So she's like rescuing her out of, which I think she's like half English oh. or something like that. Yeah. So she's like saving her for yeah. like bringing Come her back her. to her, her, her yeah. like, true land. Yeah, exactly. So I think in the context, I think you're right. We're supposed to see her as like, look, if you want to make a child, Maybe don't dig up corpses and swim them together. <laughs> Instead, go to a foreign country with a very paternalistic aspect and just steal them from their native land and raise them as if they're your own. Obviously, that's the better way to do it. <laughs> to be fair, like, at the same time I was reading this, I was also, like, got looped into, like, adoption TikTok. <laughs> um, yeah, that'll, that'll do you. <laughs> then you're just like, this is exactly everything that everyone is talking about. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, you know, and... Of course, from a modern conception, there is this question of like, look, if your fate is that for whatever reason, you're not able to have children, should you try to supersede that with science or with, you know, quote unquote, good good works or, you know, I mean, these are still questions that we're having today, literally on TikTok. Right. And we, and we literally have these conversations about AI right now, generative AI. AI. It's like, we're like, what are the ethics of this? Right. (laughs) Um, so it's hard to overstate how iconic this book is and how important it is in the canon because of those concepts. I mean, I don't think we can, any of us can deny, even while we're somehow still asking these questions in the 21st century, like these are important questions to ask. Yeah. I think if you had asked Mary Shelley, she would have thought we would have answered them by (laughs) now. She's like, I already told you it was a bad idea. (laughs) Don't do it. (laughs) Steal babies. That's fine. Just don't do the, don't do the corpse thing. (laughs) And you know, And I do wonder if there's, like, for Frankenstein, as we're, like, on this conversation of, like, usurping motherhood, right? Like, is there a little bit of a Lady Macbeth, like, he's, like, unsex me now so that I can operate in the role of the other? Because Mm -hmm. there is sort of, like, this sense of omnipotence that you can be both the female and the male. Right. And then I think that's sort of, like, when we look at Christian cosmology, that 
that is one of the attributes that we see of like, yes, it's God the Father or whatever, but when we talk about Elohim God, like we're talking about creator God and that's, you know, he's creating the world in seven days, he's making right. all of the animals, he's, he's making this world like breathe into life, right? He, and so that gendered aspect of God the Father isn't really... No, it's not identified really until later chapters. In no, later like, books isn't in... isn't Elohim actually kind of like a they? Yes, yeah. it's a plural of a divine being. Right. Yeah, uh, a, a title. It, it, it could be like a title for king or lord as well, but in the context of Christian scripture, I suppose biblical scholars think it means like creator God. Um. So again, going back to that like Lady Macbeth thing, is he like doing Lady Macbeth? Like, is there a greater evil than you trying to kind of swap and I and usurp the role in authority? And this is not like an anti-trans thing. That's Sorry, not what that's we're talking, not what I'm talking, talking about. about. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like trying to occupy the seats of power in both sexes. Right. Because we're talking, I mean, this is still a thing today, but we're talking about more than just like... I'm talking about biological sex. Yeah. We're talking about like, like, well, and also, like, the power structure roles that mm -hmm. these, you know, genders, like... Occupy. Occupy, exactly. And, like, the struggles that those like, automatically create mm -hmm. just because society's like, these are the roles. Yeah, like, how much power do you need if you're already a man and then you're trying to step into, like, the one thing that women are like, turns out I have a womb, baby. <laughs> like... <laughs> um, and then the final thing, and this might be also a reach that I noticed about this book, is what, and we talked about, and this is the corollary of like, okay, what if God made Adam and then was horrified? He made right. Adam in his own image. What do you do with that? If that reflects back on you, how do you understand yourself? So on the Greek mythology side, is it Narcissus in mm. inverse where Frankenstein, again, he, he creates this creature to reflect back to him his own identity. It's a very egotistical uh, endeavor on his part. Right, right. And he you know, and instead of falling in love with his own image as Narcissus does, he is terrified by it and abandons and rejects the monster, which is an abandonment and rejection of the self. Right, right. Well, not taking responsibility for it mm -hmm. also. Like, he rejects yeah. it and then is also, but like, it's also he, not my, my problem. And he doesn't res take responsibility for his own literal self. Right, right. As in that, you know, it's a very immature response, I might say. But like, yeah. I mean, in re in not taking responsibility for the creature, he also doesn't take responsibility for himself because right. they're mirror images of each other. So those are my thoughts on the analytical side. And I think that they are valid thoughts. Thanks. <laughs> well, it turned out we weren't going to disagree with each other as much as we thought we were. Damn, there are no throwing of fists today. Oh, man. <laughs> no pulling of hair. Turns out we're still friends. This what might, the heck? This might be why we're friends, where we can be like, I didn't like the thing that you liked, but let's talk about it anyway. <laughs> and you know, and I do, I, I think there's a lot of validity with like us having a very, and because I want to go back to the like Mary Shelley as an icon thing. Right. Which is like, we have a problem in our society of very uncritically elevating people as icons as heroes as people that we want to, to look up to, to look up to this is like my new like i've always felt this way but i haven't really articulated it which is like i don't care about so like i do not think anybody i don't care if they're a politician or a celebrity or you know your favorite spiritual leader or your favorite actor or whatever right or the person at the nonprofit that you love that you think has the best mission in the world you do not elevate that person and worship them in any way. They're just a human being, just like you and me. They have their own faults. They have their own foibles. And in fact, they might be terrible people. They might not even just be okay people like most of us trying to be decent folks walking around in the world. They might be terrible people. Yeah. Well, and I think that this is where it comes into, like, for me it should be more about like their accomplishments because when we pull in them as a human being mm -hmm. and mesh that in with their accomplishments and try to make it be like this great accomplishment that they did mm -hmm. made everything about them good, mm -hmm. then we get super messy and that's when we end yeah. up like, you know, being really upset because they, you know, eventually it turns out they weren't that great. Mm -hmm. Like I am perfectly fine with looking at the accomplishment and being like, that, that was, was really great. cool that you like, wrote that book. Exactly. But that's, you know, what was not cool. <laughs> Some of your other stuff you did. The other stuff you did. <laughs> yeah. And you can take them as like discrete parts of who this person was right. and what they did in this world. Because I feel like that leads like also some really great accomplishments not being acknowledged mm -hmm. because the person that's attached to them isn't as cool. Yeah. So we're just going to be like, well, mm -hmm. I guess you don't like, you don't make a snappy internet video mm -hmm. about that. It's like, 
like we need to start paying attention to the work itself, mm -hmm. to the accomplishment, to like what's being done mm -hmm. instead of being like, was she pretty? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's well, also a part of it. You yeah. know, like Mary Shelley's like yeah. little portraits that we have of her, you know, for a time era in which a lot of those portraits were not very good, you yeah. know, like she's quite attractive in comparison. I mean, yeah. like, you know, when we have a lot of photographs of like women from the 1940s, often like they're later in life. Yeah. And so they don't like make cool you know, internet photos, but Mary Shelley, we have this cute little portrait right. of her. And like that in and of itself, we should be questioning ourselves mm -hmm. about like how feminist are we when our feminist icons have to be pretty. Exactly. And, and I think it's like being able to hold those two realities hand in hand. I mean, I would say the same thing about Tolstoy. He was a horrible husband, you know, to his <laughs> wife. He has a lot of problems, you know, <laughs> but I really enjoy his works. And right. I even really agree with certain things that he says in his works, even though he himself, I would say, didn't live them out. Right. And, and you have to be able to hold those in your hand, in both hands at the same time and judge them on their own merits. Rather than trying to like mash them together and be like, no, like yeah. I'm going to kind of rewrite the motives here mm -hmm. to make it look cool. Yeah. Or reject something like you're saying, reject something out of hand because it's association with someone who frankly was a horrible husband and very problematic. Right. And so we have to be able to, and I'm not saying separate the art from the artist. They, they are inextricably linked, linked, but yeah. you have to hold the, the paradox of humanity together. In, right. In your you hands. can't manipulate that to so that, make it seem like it's different. So that different. you can make a simple judgment. Frankly. Right, exactly. And yeah. also live in a world that feels quite secure and comprehensible. Right. Be, and I think that's like, for me, the other thing that happens is like when you're looking for these people to worship, you're sort of like trying to offload the responsibility of becoming an integrated person yourself. Right. And being able to... I, I Be okay I, with your own foibles. Right. Course. Exactly. Like, I feel like there are a lot of people who are very uncomfortable with any shades of gray mm -hmm. and like they just want everything to be black and white. Mm -hmm. That is a difficult way to live for mm -hmm. one thing. But that way of living also means you end up manipulating facts mm -hmm. and, and, and manipulating your own view of yourself. Exactly. And, and if Frankenstein is a lesson, if you ever have to have a good stark look at yourself and you're appalled, what do you do with that? If that's your worldview and everything else crumbles. Yeah. Like, because the reality is we're, we don't live in a black and white world. Yeah. Like, if and your world... you're not black or white. Right, yeah. Like, if you think the world is black and white, we need to do some examinations. Because it's just... Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. So, I think we... We arrived at a really interesting place here. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll just leave that little life advice from Alexandra and Emily. Oh, there you go. <laughs> enjoy those shades of gray. <laughs> yeah. But don't enjoy shades of gray. Or no, 50 shades of gray. When it, we don't advocate the reading of that book. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, let's see. Should we wrap it up there? I think we should. I think that's a good place to, to leave it. I hope you enjoy your spooky season. And again, yeah. check out our vampire episode. episode if you're looking for some more. Because that was a fun episode. That was a fun one. I we did so many books. <laughs> yeah. And let us know what you guys are reading for spooky season. Because yeah. I'm like getting my TBR ready for that. Oh, yeah. I've, I've started already. Yeah. I, though I don't think I'm going to make it through Anne Rex. <laughs> I started that and I'm just struggling yeah. to get through. <laughs> that one I struggled to get through. So that says something. <laughs> yeah. I feel like. Anyway. All um, right. So we'll talk with you guys next time. See you next month. Thanks See so much. Later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.